Good evening from CNN Headline News. Attorney General Janet Reno is putting cyber vandals on notice. She says the FBI will do everything it can to catch them and bring them to justice. So how much are these cyber vandals costing us? Well, according to Lloyds of London, last year, hacking cost companies $20 billion in lost revenues and repair costs. Sounds incredible, but it's true. You've been hearing about whiter whites and brighter colors for years. So which detergents really deliver? Find out. Magníficas tarifas a Latinoamérica. .com, the only search engine that the... Well, somebody who uh, certainly knows something about the difference between criminals and hackers uh, is someone we've been talking about for many, many years here on this, uh, on this program. He's the, uh, the center of the whole free Kevin movement. And, of course, that would be... Kevin Mitnick himself. Kevin, are you there? I'm here. How you doing? Doing a lot better than I was a few weeks ago. <laughs> or a couple of years ago, even. When you first went in, uh, the net was a completely different place, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the uh, uh, mosaic was at version 1.0, and, uh, and people were using links. I mean, the, the Internet has completely boomed while I was in custody. I remember seeing that article five years ago, the, the front page article. We're not talking about the one that uh, on July 4th, 1994. We'll get to that one in a little bit. But the one on February 15th, 1995 by John Markoff uh, that basically was, was giving the details of, of your arrest in North Carolina. In the first paragraph, they said uh, that uh, you were caught with 20,000 credit card numbers. And I think it was 19 paragraphs later that they mentioned, he mentioned, uh, that there was no indication that you had ever used any of them. We'll just go blame somebody without evidence they say oh hackers did this no but sure you can well they did obviously it just happened but how do you know hackers did it how do you know I mean somebody going out there and 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 turning on a you know an OC 12 or whatever and aiming it at somebody and over overwhelming them with with uh, all kinds of, of nonsensical packets and bringing them down to their knees and, and taking them off the net entirely that turns them into a hacker just because they do that I mean, you know, anybody with the access could have done this, and not everybody with access is a hacker. And uh, this is Emmanuel Goldstein. We'll be back again next week with another exciting edition of Off the Hook. For Isaac, have yourselves a good night. I'm Eugene E. Kasparov. What do you do? Um, that, that's really a good question. I've done a lot of things. Uh, I've driven a tow truck. Got very good at driving tow trucks at one point in my life. I'm probably better known for the work that I do with computers. I built my first computer when I was 10 years old. I. Uh, Played a lot with computers when I was a teenager. In my early 20s, I did uh, some work in medical billing systems. I did some work for the United States government. And then I went back to driving tow trucks. It is widely held that 
mankind has got basic rights. For the most part, those basic rights that are represented in the Bill of Rights, added to the U.S. Constitution and copied by constitutions around the world. Of those rights, two of the ones that I feel are the most important are the freedom of speech and the freedom to privacy. Both of these rights are the freedoms of communication. And uh, I believe strongly in those rights. The internet has been a societal revolution. And the reason the internet's been a societal revolution is that it has changed the way fundamentally that we as a worldwide society communicate. Many people feel that the internet is a free international communication medium, when in fact it's not. The internet as we know it today is controlled by the United States government. And I'm opposed to this. The United States government, through its contracts and programs, controls everything from IP address allocations to who has overriding authority over the domain name space. In addition, they govern how the tier one internet providers can do business. Ultimately, this ends up translating to total control of the internet. The cut off is that you see, if we got rid of this switch and these two tracks, three tracks, including the pink one, rose two and a half inches, then we could duck underneath them here only half an inch down. 
So the Gifford City approach rises to here and then falls again. Not to let this guy get through, but to let the Alvar cutoff get through under this edge. Right. That's right. Yeah. A lot of electrical engineering hackers joined the club to work on this, or its predecessor. This is an electromechanical system. Suffice it to say that this, this control system was an attraction to the sort of people who liked uh, logic problems and switching circuits. And the same kind of people were attracted to computers when they first became available. So a great deal of computer hacking, that is to say independent research as it were by students, uh, originated out of the MIT club where the students were already here working on the system and also on our own telephone system. Uh, there was a <coughs> computer available on one of the buildings next door to the original club that uh, had a nice big round display on it and this was used to make a program called Space War which was sort of an early early video game which had little rocket ships and a sun and this was fairly sophisticated in terms of one version of it had a, a real time uh, diagram of the solar system where all the stars were and so forth and, uh, the sun had gravity, and if, if you fired a, uh, a projectile from your rocket, it, it curved inward toward the sun due to the gravity, and, and so forth. So it had all that, uh, these you know, basically high-tech high -tech features, and it was considered a, uh, an intellectual challenge, I think, to, to add these features. And other, other people involved would say, oh, that's neat, you know, could you make it do such and such? So it was always, a ca I think, a case of... Peter Sampson actually added the entire uh, celestial firmament, all right. the stars in all the correct place, slowly precessing across the back. Right. And so, you know, this was, this was considered a very admirable thing to do, to, to do something that was intellectually challenging. I came to MIT in 1958. Um, Actually, the first thing I did when I came to MIT after checking in was to uh, go to the uh, refreshment activities midway and found the Tech Model Railroad Club and, uh, and sort of never left. Computer hacking at Tamerk started with the TX-0. Uh, we just uh, had this, this very capable computer of its day. The telephone system security was mostly security by obscurity. That is the assumption that people wouldn't understand it well enough to exploit it. And so you get a bunch of MIT students who, for whom understanding how things work is a, is a major goal in life. You're describing as sort of the, the, the principle of the attractive nuisance. Uh, you, have, you have some complex system out there, be it the phone system, be it in later days computer networks. And certainly there's a, there's a grand temptation to to demonstrate your understanding and mastery over the system by getting to do things that it wasn't intended to do. Four or five years ago, I got my first computer. It was a used 486 SX33. Um, didn't even come with a CD-ROM drive. I had a little 13-inch monitor. I paid about 800 bucks for it. Um, I loved it. I really did. And uh, the first thing I did when I got it home, I took I took the thing apart and I put in a CD-ROM drive. I, I was like uh, 11, 12 years old. It was the first thing I did before I even turned it on. And uh, I, I just fell in love with them. I mean, it, it's something that I absolutely love to do. Um, after that, that computer eventually broke. Uh, my mother got a computer, a uh, Dell Pentium 200, with all of 32 megs of RAM and Windows 98. And uh, I started playing with it, and I started changing literally everything. She would wake me up in the middle of the night and yell at me because her computer wasn't working. I'm Mike Udek. And uh, what do you do? Uh, right now I'm working at a uh, computer security company doing research into new products. Um, I'm chief scientist over here. I do uh, 
a lot of uh, computer security research and development. Um, in the past, I've maintained a computer security website and was uh, frequently known as a hacker. definite community, but I think that the community is more made up of people who wish to be hackers than it is of actual hackers, the public community at least. Uh, when you see these people at 2600 meetings and the like, they tend not to have the skill that um, someone who would legitimately be called a hacker would have. talk to a lot of people in the area, a lot of people I, I can't really talk about who have uh, done things that they shouldn't have done, whether they be gray hat, black hat, or white hat, uh, some of whom have, have been arrested, some of whom have not. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult area to be in, especially because um, more often than not, the FBI will assume you guilty before proven innocent. and. Uh, Therefore, a lot of these people keep very low profiles. You won't see most of the more skilled people at a 2600 meeting, for instance. Um, and there's good reason for that. It's because uh, they're not, uh, they, it, there's a saying that the best hacker is the one you've never heard about, and it's very true. The hackers tend uh, to be loners, but only in society in general when they're with other hackers, not loners at all. Well, that's what it is, the pencil. You, you wedge a piece in there so that it doesn't reset. You're holding down the button, you're holding down the pin, so that it won't do the hardware reset. Yeah, when you buy that, um, the thing is, I think the case against Emmanuel and against the others who have released the DVD uh, uh, crack is ridiculous. Uh, you don't sue people when they post a vulnerability to bug track. You thank them. When a vulnerability is discovered, um, public disclosure is the way that everyone has always traditionally gone in the computer industry. It might otherwise cause trouble off the government's back on a ridiculous intellectual trail. I don't know. Let's see what we got here. I consider most of the people here in one shape, or shape way, or form hackers, because hackers doesn't just apply to um, computers. I think it, it applies to everything. It applies to people who can talk their way out of situations. It applies to people who can take two different pieces of equipment apart that have nothing to do with one another and make a different piece of equipment out of them. I got my first computer, an IBM PC, when I was seven years old, and uh, the first thing I did was take it apart, and it made my grandparents' heart jump out of their ribcage because they just paid $7,500 for this thing. So they were, they were miffed, and I said, hey, look, I can put it back together, I promise, and I did, and from, from that time until the time I was able to buy my own PC, they never denied me a new PC because they knew that, you know, that was going to be it for me.
share the knowledge has always been the watchword of TAP, the Technological American Party, which was a newsletter I published for many years. It died out in 84, just as 2600 magazine, the Hackers Quarterly, started up. And so the, the torch has been handed off and carried, as it were, by 2600 magazine. You are in New York, which is an activist center, primarily because you have a large population to draw from, can get together from the various boroughs. They're just a subway right away. But mostly because New York is the communications capital of America. All the TV networks are here, the news organizations are here, and if it's going to make noise anywhere, it's going to make noise in New York. And so because it's the communications capital, we get all these political activists, and they happen to come to the technology convention of ours. They get up and they bring their politics into to our technical sessions. And so it seems like it's a more political convention. Uh, ask the people running it. We'll go, politics? Huh? What? Lately, we've had to get into political issues because the politics are invading the technology. Ordinarily, we don't really like to mess with politics because that kind of adversarial relationship has nothing to do with the pure technical operation and, and the technical sophistication of what we like to play with, the hardware. All hacking is, is hacking away at a computer keyboard until it does what you want it to do. That's all. Our proper title has been usurped by the press and handed off to these 14-year-old twerps that crack into system uh, security, and we call those people crackers because they crack system security. Some of the things that they're planning to do on the hacktivism front are great, such as providing internet access for the Chinese. It's almost like they're closed off on a local network rather than the huge global network. They don't know what's out there. Um, they have no idea. Um, they haven't seen the tip of the iceberg yet. And what the hacktivists are planning to do is punch some holes in their, their defense system, if you will, where they, they're keeping the Chinese inside and letting them out so they can see what's out there on that whole internet, the whole global internet. I think that's a good thing. I think it's time that the, that the Chinese got their eyes open beyond what's given to them by the government so they can see what's really going on out here and let the citizens of that country decide for themselves whether or not they should be granted that access and a revolution will occur. attorney has said that I am probably at most just facing um, a fine and uh, in Norway fines are based on uh, income the previous year and I didn't have an income last year so <laughs> sometimes a guy is screwed and I'm terribly afraid Emmanuel might get screwed but when you look at the solid facts behind the case, the technology behind the case, I think Emmanuel's going to come out on top, and I think the MPAA is just running scared. They started something. They did not understand what they were starting because they don't understand the bits and bytes of the technology, and I think it's going to go back and bite them. If you're wondering why this kid is up here talking about computers that were made 10, 5 years before he was born, um, Question, the answer is, I was always interested in computers when I was very small. And the type of computers that I'm talking about here were the computers that were around then. So I just became very interested in finding out what was around before me and from around when I was born. So in the process of kind of having that history lesson, I became very interested in these computers. We've 
gotten involved in this case because we really see it as a, a fundamental threat to our most basic civil liberties in this country. I don't necessarily think it's a counterculture. I think it's a part of culture. Um, I believe in socially responsible hacking. Technology and the deployment of technology is a great force that is affecting the daily lives of everybody in our society today more and more every day as technology speeds forward. The employment of this technology in our daily lives brings up real issues. Issues that pertain to those basic human rights we hold, those basic human rights of communication. Now on the one hand, the development of the laws, the accepted societal norms which control that technology is driven largely by commercial interests. The hackers largely are the people's voice that can be raised up to have an effect on the development of those rules, those laws, which govern the deployment of the technology for the people, not for the commercial interests. 